It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mark L. Bailey. Dr. Mark Bailey stepped into his new role as chancellor in July of 2020 after serving 19 years at Dallas Theological Seminary as the fifth president, and he continues his role as senior professor in the Bible Exposition Department as well as chancellor. In addition to his 35 years at DTS, he has pastored various churches in Arizona and Texas. He's a published author and an in-demand Bible conference speaker in engagements all over the country and all over the world. His overseas ministries have included a variety of places. He has been a regular tour leader in Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, and Rome. And his current board service includes Bible study fellowship, walk through the Bible ministries, Word of Life, International Alliance for Christian Education, and Steve Green Ministries. It is always a pleasure to have our Chancellor here to speak to us. Would you please welcome my former boss, Dr. Mark Bailey. Well, good morning. What a privilege it is to be here and uh, see you all, and uh, thank you for the privilege of being involved in uh, DTS, and so I uh, now report the other way, and uh, to the board, and I serve at the uh, privilege and pleasure of the uh, president as well to support him, and Barbie and I uh, have a ministry of prayer uh, for those ministries in which we're involved at our church and the seminary, and uh, especially the, uh, <clears throat> the leadership, and so uh, uh, Mark and Jennifer get prayed for uh, every single night as well as uh, the other ministries that we're involved with and their leadership. Uh, I don't have to tell you <clears throat> that we're living in a culture of hate, politically, uh, spiritually, militarily. Uh, I'm finding the message of the prophets more relevant now than ever. As the prophet Isaiah said, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness and then I hadn't noticed this last phrase, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It is the, at the root deception of the world, the flesh, and the devil to redefine reality in opposition to God and what is true. One definition of sin or better manifestation of sin is any attempt to find meaning in life apart from God. The clarion call of the prophetic message of the scriptures is to find in God that reality that will truly satisfy or bring shalom to the soul. God calls us into a relationship reconciled by Christ that corresponds to the nature of true reality, both origins as well as destiny. The world can only offer cheap substitutes and consequently not only misses what uh, becomes hostile to the biblical message, not only misses what is true, but becomes hostile to the biblical message and to those of us who would bring it. H how do you and I live and love Christ, live for Christ and love him in a world that doesn't accept him or believe that he came to save them and to give them abundant life? The Bible speaks to that in more times than you might think. This morning, I want us to turn to one. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 10, a very contextual message in a great book, Matthew chapter 10. And our focus today is what, what does a loyal love for Christ look like in a culture of hate and hostility? Matthew's literary structure is an alternating pattern of a narrative followed by discourse. And at the end of each of those discourses, it begins a new narrative when it says, when he had finished speaking these words or when he had finished saying this. And it's that uh, alternating narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse, in which we find the five discourses in Matthew's gospel, where Jesus is related to the law through the Sermon on the Mount and uh, what was the true intention of God's standard for righteousness it was never hand ritual over heart righteousness, but was always at a core, a righteousness of the heart. In Matthew chapter 10, we'll come back to Matthew chapter 10. It's really that the first commission of the book, the great commission comes at the end of the book, but there's a first commission in which Jesus sends out his 12 with a ministry and a message for Israel alone. 
uh, the gospel uh, to Israel first and then the rest of the world. And he patterns that here. And then uh, the consequences of uh, their rejection, uh, you come to Matthew chapter 13 with the third great discourse, which is uh, what's gonna happen to God's kingdom now that Israel has said no. And the book of Matthew, as you know, is written to the church years after the events of the gospels. And it uh, can be confusing if you can't remember that this document was given to the church to help explain why they are there, what happened with Jesus, what happened with Israel, what's gonna to happen to God's kingdom. The fourth discourse is in Matthew chapter 18, which specifically relates to the church and how it should function in a disciplined community and one of forgiveness. And then the last one is the Olivet Discourse. And so you really move from a, a look backward to the Old Testament to the present history of the life of Christ. What's gonna happen between the advents, including the first and second advent? What is God's plan with regard to the church? And then what's God's plan for the future? And those five discourses are chronological in nature, but explanatory of the great move of God in history. Paul tells us in a number of passages that the Old Testament and that pre-cross material was valuable for us, not only for warnings, not to turn our hearts to do evil like they did, but to also uh, through the scriptures that we might have encouragement. Uh, the relevancy of the Old Testament continues. It's still our Bible. And Paul says it has lasting value, not only to warn us not to make the same mistakes his people have made or others have made throughout history, but it's also a place where we find hope and encouragement. So both the warnings as well as the uh, message of hope comes through the Old Testament scriptures and the pre-cross material. So I want us to jump into this passage, and I, I want you to see it in its breadth to start with. It's, it's the first commission of the disciples being sent out to a Jewish audience exclusively with the offer, the proffer, or depending which words you like, the presentation of the message of the kingdom. In verses one through four, we have the appointment of the 12. Uh, in uh, verses uh, five through 15, if you let your eyes just mark your way, or walk your way through that, you have the instructions to the 12. The audience was to be exclusively Jewish, not Gentile, uh, not Samaritan. Go not accept to the uh, uh, lost of the sheep of the house of Israel. The message was a message of the kingdom. Uh, the miracles that the disciples were to do, and by the way, don't miss this contextualized exclusivity. Every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Some people want to standardize those sections of God's history where he did extraordinary things as normative. They were never normative, otherwise they wouldn't be miracles, number one. But they were never normative for all time. Every kind of sickness, every kind of disease, these disciples could heal. Those miracles manifested the immediate authority of the Messiah who was present. The response of the people revealed their receptivity to the messenger. And that uh, divine domino effect of whoever receives uh, you receives me, whoever receives me receives the Father, that goes back and forth, uh, reception one way, rejection the other way. And the actions of the disciples were then to be symbolic of either coming judgment or coming blessing. If the house received you, it was shalom to that house. If it wasn't, you left and shook the dust off your feet and kept moving, which was a sign of judgment. The appointment of the 12, the instructions for the 12. In verses 16 to 23, we see the warnings of the 12. There's warnings of re religious persecution that will come in verses 16 and 17 from a Jewish audience to Jewish believers. Civil persecution will come by both Jews and Gentiles in 18 to 20. Family persecution and betrayal, even to the extent of murder within the family or martyrdom in verse 21. And then he goes to universal persecution. You'll be hated by all, verse 22, because of my name. But the one who has endured to the end will be saved. In other words, even if it costs you your life or you live to the end of when the Lord decides to take you or come back for you, he's got you. He, he's got you. It's with that background of uh, instruction in a historical context, warnings for them that I take it start in their lifetime and continue as we'll see. But he tells us that that universal persecution by all will extend all the way to the end of the age, to the second coming. Look at verse 22. 
You'll be hated by all because of my name, but it's the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you'll not finish going through the chief cities, through, excuse me, through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. A couple things here. Number one, this ministry of evangelism is to continue to the end of the age. But number two, there's not only the need to keep witnessing to the end of the age, but it speaks of a future of God's purposes for his people Israel. Craig Blomberg calls it, I love this, a perpetually incomplete Jewish mission that won't be finished because God's not finished with his people, as Romans chapters 11 tell us. So the sufferings that they're experiencing in their present world actually become anticipatory of the sufferings that anyone will face until the coming of Christ, and especially, as the Olivet Discourse will tell you, it will heat up in intensive ways during the latter part of the tribulation. But verses 24 to 42 expand this thing beyond that time frame, and it's like in, in light of that whole framework from now to the coming of Christ, what does it mean to identify with Christ? He says in verse 24, a disciple is not above his teacher or a slave above his master. For it's enough that a disciple become like his teacher and a slave like his master. Would it be enough if we could just be like Christ? I love that phrase, it is enough. It is enough. But if they called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more the members of his house? You see, uh, the model of responding to opposition for God's call in Christ, God's uh, purposes in Christ is Christ himself. He'll tell us in John 15, marvel not if the world hates you, it hated, hated me first. And then he explains why. And he does so here in this context as well. Beelzebub was a derogatory term from the Philistine God. It became a term that was the worst thing you could probably say and then became applied to the worst person you could possibly think, which was Satan himself. And so it's another way of saying you get your power from the devil. They called the head of the house by that term. What kind of uh, cancel culture terminology will they use for you? Now, I want to break it here and move to the end of this chapter. We'll come back and pick it up here. But look over at verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. If you don't love Christ above all earthly relationships, and especially those that normally would be the closest, your family, Matthew says you're not worthy of Christ. Now, there's a parallel passage I want you to turn to. This is a passage of comparison, but turn over to Luke chapter 14, verse 25. Luke chapter 14 and verse 25, and you find another statement that's in a different kind of a context, but with a similar theme that introduces the, what it means to follow Christ in a hostile world. He says, now large crowds were going along with him and he turned and he said to them, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, one of the things that you have to do is ask the question, is this being addressed to believers or unbelievers? And as you compare the gospel accounts of this concept, the answer is yes. <laughs> Matthew's gospel, chapter uh, 16, he addresses it specifically to the disciples. Mark, it's to the disciples and the whole group. Here in Luke, it's to the whole crowd. So the question is, where are you in relationship to Christ when you hear this call that he wants an exclusive relationship with you that surpasses all other relationships? It may be a call for you to step across that line of faith for the first time. It may be a passage that you read when you're 65 or 70 years old and realize, I still have a ways to go in cultivating that love relationship with Christ. But what does it mean? Do I wake up in the morning? And Barbie would be here, but she's at a doctor's office. She has surgery. We appreciate your prayers this next Tuesday. And uh, so we're getting ready for that. But uh, do I wake up in the morning, look at her in the eyes and say, honey, I hate you. <laughs> Jesus told me to say that. <laughs> Father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, 
She would remind me, yeah, but even your own life, he says that too. So what is this concept of hate and love? It's a, it's a concept of, of a contrast, whereas Matthew's is a, a statement of comparison, this is a statement of contrast. When, uh, imagine that those of you who are married or about to be married began courting or being courted, and uh, what, what, what were some of the signs that uh, things were starting to click? And the relationship was moving past surface level and uh, there was a future in it, and uh, you began uh, uh, pursuing that relationship. Depending on which side of the relationship you were on, uh, both of you probably uh, began to crave to spend more time with that person. Uh, the communication went from uh, just sort of likes and dislikes to uh, what do you really love, what do you really not love? Uh, what are the purposes and goals that we have for our lives? What, what are the joint interests that uh, we both like to do? Uh, for some, it's gifts given to or sacrifices made for, intimacy of language developing. Barbie and I were dating. We started dating when she was uh, uh, 17. I robbed the cradle. We got married when she was 19. I was 21. Uh, she was still in high school when I was in my first uh, year or two of college. And uh, my dad worked at the school where she uh, attended. And so I would take my dad to school because I needed the car to go downtown. I was in a, a program of x-ray technology and heading to pre-med when God got a hold of my life. And uh, so uh, I, I would uh, drop a note in her box at the school. And then I'd come back and pick up my dad and she'd drop a note in the box for me. And they were folded like flags. You know how all that stuff goes. <laughs> but at the hospital gift shop, uh, I only made $75 a month stipend because I was still in training. But I spent almost all of that $75 in the hospital gift shop, which is the biggest ripoff place you'd ever find. <laughs> and I bought her anything and everything I thought might influence her. And so I would uh, bring gifts and, and leave them. And uh, her parents were still missionaries in Argentina. She was living with her grandmother. We could only talk 15 minutes a day, and we could have one date, and we, she had to be in by 11 o'clock. And uh, we lived with that, and it was great. But uh, I, I got her stuff she didn't want, didn't need, but I was trying to impress, developing that relationship. He, he wants me to have a love for Christ that is uh, beyond that. He wants me to have a love for Christ that if you compared that infatuation and now this June will celebrate 50 years of marriage. We've been dating 53 years. That looks like hate in comparison. And if you would put my love for Christ and my love for Barbie up, it, it ought to be so contrastive that uh, you don't really like her at all in comparison to. Now, the beauty is that God uh, says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And one of those commandments is to give myself wholly to my wife. So she doesn't lose in that relationship. She actually wins. But contrast and comparison a supreme and an incomparable love for Christ. But the question is, what, what does that mean? How does that look? If you have your Bibles, I, I want to do a quick survey if, with you. Turn with me to Genesis 29. Genesis chapter 29, verses 31 to 33. When, when the Lord saw that Leah was hated by Jacob even, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren, and Leah conceived and bore him a son, and she named his uh, name Reuben. She said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction, for my, now my husband will love me. Well, he was married to both of them and had children through both of them. I don't think he, you know, said, Leah, I hate you. It's the love that he had for Rachel that made Leah feel unloved in comparison. There's hate love in that Merizim of uh, polarities that are so common in the Old Testament. I love this one when you come to 2 Samuel chapter 19, verses 5 and 6, you get that same thing. And Joab came into the house of the king and said, You have today covered with shame the faces of all of your servants. For this day you have saved your life and the lives of your sons and your daughters and the lives of your wives and your concubines because you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. For you've made it clear today that the commanders and the servants are nothing to you. For today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, you would be pleased. David so mourned the loss of his rebellious son Absalom. Absalom. 
that everybody else around him felt unloved and even hated. Same words. Proverbs 13, 24 says, whoever spares the rod hates his son. Now, people who don't discipline their kids would never say, I did it because I hated him. They, they mistakenly think that they don't need to discipline because they just need to love them. But wisdom tells us that if you avoid the discipline, it actually is not loving your son or daughter enough. But he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. You see, that love-hate combination, comparison, contrast is all the way through. I love Isaiah 60, verse 15. It says, whereas you have been forsaken and hated, speaking of uh, the enemies coming in against Israel, with no one passing through, I will make you a majestic forever, a joy from age to age. In the discipline of God's judgment and the enemy nations taking over Israel during the captivities, it wasn't that God didn't love them, but it appeared forsaken. It appeared like hatred. I don't think God the Father hated his son when Jesus said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But just that love, hate, relationship. I love Malachi chapter one. Malachi is a book that sort of has teenage whines all the way through it. Where in, where in, where in? You can hear the tune in the margin. I've loved you, says the Lord, but you say, well, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I've loved Jacob, but Esau I've hated. I've laid waste his hill country, left his heritage to a jackal in the desert. The choice of choosing one over the other in a comparison even to a point of contrast is the issue. No one can serve two masters, Jesus said earlier in Matthew. You can't have dual loyalties. You'll either hate one and love the other or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon or money. Why? Because uh, loyal love brings with it a comparison that ought to be to the level of a contrast. The call to biblical discipleship is to that supreme and incomparable love relationship of loyalty to Jesus in spite of the culture. I want to go back and ask the question, what is it that keeps us from making that decision of loving loyalty in our world? And I love the fact that Jesus says, let me tell you, what causes that. Back up in verse 24 of this passage, he says this, a disciple is not above his teacher nor a slave above his master. It's enough for a disciple that he become like his teacher and a slave like his master. If they call the house, head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will be the members of his household? Therefore, watch what he says. He wants them to understand the principle, but be prepared for rejection in the context. But he says, therefore, do not fear them. Watch the repetition of this term. For there is uh, nothing that is conceived that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light. Whatever you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim on the housetops. Uh, don't fear those people who will say, you're, you're a Beelzebul. You, you, you believe a damnable heresy. You are a bigoted, intolerant person because of the stand that you have taken from a biblical perspective. He commands us, do not fear them. Why? Don't fear what people might say because one day the real tale will be told. The real story will be known and truth will ultimately win. That's the fear of slander. The second fear, he says, in verse 27, excuse me, 28, do not fear those who can kill the body but are unable to kill the soul. Don't, don't fear human suffering. The worst they can do is take you out <laughs> physically. But he goes on to say the one you ought to fear is the one who could take you out and then sentence you to hell as opposed to heaven. You're to fear God, not man. Worst thing they can do with you is to kill you. Then what? Oh yeah, resurrection. Hello. That's why Paul could say, for to be to live is Christ and to die is what? Is gain. 
Do we really believe that, men and women? Do we really believe that? That I ought to fear God more? The fear of slander, what people will say, the fear of suffering, what people might do. But there's another one that's a little bit more subtle. Look at it with me. He goes on to say, are not two sparrows, verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a cent, and yet there's not one of them that falls to the ground apart from your father. I used to go to my cousin's ranch in Colorado, where I stayed for a summer while my little sister was having open heart surgery when she was two, and I shot a lot of sparrows. I didn't keep count, <laughs> but he did. God knows when a sparrow falls, so when I get to heaven, I'll find out how many I actually did. <laughs> they were a bit of a nuisance on the farm, but uh, you may not like that, but you're called to forgive me. The very hairs on your head are numbered. That's easier for him to do with some than others. But he has them counted. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I'll confess him before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I'll also deny him in heaven. Do not think I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. <laughs> I like to call that the dark side of Christmas. I didn't come to bring peace, I came to bring a sword. But his third fear is, don't, don't fear what others might think. The significance, sparrows and numbers of hares are in his purview, aren't you? But then he goes into a, a difficult passage. His quotation is from Micah chapter seven, which has the context of them going into Babylonian captivity going into Babylonian captivity, and some of the family were saying, God would never do this. Some of them were touching the temple, going temple, temple, like King's X. You know, God's not gonna take us out of here. We're in Israel, we're his chosen people. This is his temple. He's chosen this place to place his name. He would never send us into captivity. But those of faith and understanding say, yeah, he will. And it divided their houses. And so you have this context. Look at verse 34, do not think I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. That's the, the sword of his truth. For I came to set, listen, this is Jesus talking. I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own house. Some of you come from divided families because you're on one side of the sword versus them. And some of you paid a dear price to come to seminary. And we respect you for your courage. Some of you will have to pay a your price with your kids if they choose the other side of that sword or your grandchildren if they don't get it. That sword divides across the family. It's heartbreaking, but it's true. And that's in the context where he says, if you don't love me more, then the closest family relationships of your life, you're not worthy of me. If you don't hate your father, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, yeah, even in your own life, the choice of him over you, him over me, I can't be a disciple like he wants me to be. The call is not to a segmented life. The call is not to a divided heart. The call is to a whole hearted commitment in a loyal, loving relationship where he is number one in our lives. He goes on in this passage to say, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life will lose it. He who has lost his life for my sake will find it. It's just the opposite of what the world offers. It's life in meaning with Christ. It's life as God intended life to be. That's what he's after us to do. But I want you to see that with the counting of the cost and with the threat of those, he says, be prepared for rejection. Be prepared to make a choice, but be prepared because he hasn't lost sight of what he's promised you. There's reward. Look at verses 40 and 42 to 42. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. See, every decision, excuse me, every conversation you and I have with an unbeliever is a cosmic decision. 
because we're representing Jesus who represents God. Do you think of those kind of encounters in that perspective? You're, you're the front ambassador and how, how they respond to you is how they respond to Christ and how they respond to Christ is how they respond to the Father. Therefore, if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you'll get a prophet's reward. If you receive a righteous man, uh, if you receive a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, you'll see, you'll receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. You see, the, me the messenger represents the message of the one, the ones in the Trinitarian triune God who sent us. It's not an insignificant call to bring the message of the Bible to a culture that thinks what's right is actually wrong. What's wrong is actually right. What seems sweet is actually bitter, and what's actually bitter to them is sweet. What they think is enlightenment, in reality, is darkness. So I have a question. If you were to have lunch tomorrow noon with Jesus, at an intimate setting of a table set with two, for two. And he would uh, look at you and say, call your name and say, you know what, I, I know you love me more than anything else. What would be his reasons and validation for that? Time, time spent with, uh, intimacy of conversation developing, the, the knitting of two hearts together, the forsaking of others that would get in the way of that exclusivity of relationship, the, the gifts that uh, he's received from you, the purposes of his that you have pursued. Or what do you say, you know what? Bailey, we need to talk because I'm, I'm feeling a little two-timed by you. Well, there's some uh, other things uh, that are attracting your attention. There's other interests that are uh, siphoning you away. I'm a little jealous because I, I like an exclusive relationship. He might say I feel two-timed. What could we do? What would we do? What will we do so that he could have a better list of evidence that he's the number one relationship beyond all comparison and in contrast with all other relationships of our lives? Father, it's convicting to uh, rehearse this truth from your word because as we look in the mirror, it would be easier to walk away forgetting what we see. But we know that's instability <laughs> and foolishness. And instead, you want us to reflect and change and reorient, return, repent, and pursue that love relationship that you would like to have with us through your son that is absolutely exclusive, that then guides and governs and balances all other relationships and interests. For you have a better way of life for us than we do. Help us to believe that and to pursue that, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.